Hi everyone, as it says in my abstract, mental health is an important part of the work of the GP. And so I want to celebrate my 20th year as a medical educator, telling you in 20 slides what I wish I'd known when I began my career, the bits that are hard to find in the textbooks and the revelations and the unexpected surprises I've had in my life as a clinician, a teacher and a researcher. So let's begin by acknowledging all that's gone before. I don't plan to deconstruct the notion that all GPs need to know how to diagnose, detect, diagnose and treat people with mental illness. Of course they do. But I'm going to focus on how we as educators can make the mental health curriculum come alive and engage registrars in this necessary work of the GP. So when we teach DSM and ICD-10 diagnostic categories, we also need to spend a bit of time talking about the challenges applying these labels in primary care. While many academic psychiatrists have made their career demonstrating that GPs miss depression, current best evidence actually suggests we're just as much at risk of over as under diagnosis. And over diagnosis risks over prescribing. So spend equal time teaching registrars to confidently de prescribe. Devote some of this teaching time to treatments that are easy to do, safe, and effective, like behavioural activation, relaxation techniques, structured problem solving. We see a lot of people with distress in general practice and spend a lot of time working with people who may have crossed a categorical diagnostic line at various points in their lifetime but not necessarily at the time we are seeing them. Being able to get a dimensional perspective on that life course is crucial to making wise management decisions. And please explicitly acknowledge that people have different understandings of the cause of their distress. Consider, for example, the furor when DSM-5 changed the bereavement exclusion for major depressive disorder. Sharing our explanatory models is important for both patients and doctors. Explore and revisit these as time passes. And exploring the time course of distress and a patient's explanatory models opens the registrar's awareness to the notion of tipping points. Both the patient and indeed the doctor have points at which they'll decide to act or not act. Paying attention to these decision points is a key to making progress in mental health care. So what's needed to get the narrative explanatory model and tipping points in view? It's mostly about our ability to relate to patients so revisit the communication skills training we offer our registrars. Can we teach someone to show how they care? How do patients discern their doctors as trustworthy and competent? Anne-Marie Moll's book, The Logic of Care, is a great philosophical discussion of this difference between healthcare that's a right where consumers exercise choice versus a collaborative, ongoing, relational task between clinicians and patients. And highlighting this tension between te technical and relational care is useful for registrars. Simple techniques to teach include asking a patient to bring a one or two page brief life story summary to a mental health appointment, or to draw a family genogram, or at least ask about the family history of mental illness. It sounds so simple, I know, but after years of doing ECTVs, I'm afraid it doesn't happen as much as it might. Understanding the system is part of that too. Let's look at step care as an example. So the pic on the left here, courtesy of the Diamond Study, shows us what we doctors currently do in the management of depression, and the pic on the right shows us what the experts think we should do. How do we prepare registrars for this ongoing, often chaotic change in the way we deliver care? Because in the real world, trying to step up and step down care often feels more like this. Our registrars need to understand the hierarchy of care for various mental health problems, but just as much they need to understand this often non-linear way that patients come in and out of mental health care. Relationships trump systems every time. In other words, they need to know the ins and outs of mental health care beyond an overly biomedical or organic model of care. So I love this diagram from Trish Greenhow's book that reminds GPs in training to look left, really, really far left, because this is the cornerstone of our discipline. We need to stick with people over time, revisiting options for care as the time passes. And this is particularly important in conditions like depression, where the efficacy of most treatments we offer is roughly 50%, with placebo response only about 10% behind. Teaching registrars how to engage patients in monitoring practice really matters. And to take this monitoring role, we also need strong relationships with other mental health professionals, so registrars need really specific advice on how to make and then maintain these networks. The Mental Health Professionals Network is one example of our work to build strong collaborative practice 
and there are shared care guidelines from our esteemed colleges as well. And to take the case for collaboration one step further, carers really are the elephant in the room. Registrars need to specifically learn to work with family and friends of patients in their care. In our organisation, we've been using carer educators for many years now, and they bring an amazing richness to this discussion. So bust the myths about this work taking time and being difficult. It can be the most rewarding part of a GP's life. Share the stories of success from your own practice with registrars and reframe heart sink and difficult patients. Google the work of our very own Louise Stone to teach a better way of thinking about care. And to help registrars make this step from a discussion about heart sink patients into a stigma-free zone where care can blossom, I recommend reading, listening, watching, understand the lived experience. And this can happen through art, literature, film, music, expand your learner's horizons. Teach registrars the importance of trust. Boundaries are important, but so is reciprocity, honesty, and the occasional hug. I teach the concept of the professional friend and explicitly address the delicate dance of transference and counter-transference that can enhance or harm care, depending on the clinician's awareness. And to achieve the level of doctor-patient relationship, remember to be a role model to registrars of good self-care. Empathic practice can be exhausting, but enriching as well. Mental health competent GPs know how to look after themselves. But maybe that's a topic for another picture kutcher. <laughs> <laughs>